This is Antigua, one of the most beautiful islands in the Caribbean and a place that we think of today as a kind of paradise. It's a place where people come on honeymoon, a playground of the super rich. It's famous for its beautiful beaches, exotic waters and tropical fruit. But when the young naval captain Horatio Nelson came here in 1784 to serve at what was then a hugely important naval base, he wrote to a friend, I detest this country. And he described that stunning harbour as an infernal hole. It's hard to imagine what Nelson could have found that was so extraordinarily unpleasant here. But remarkable new research now underway in Antigua is uncovering graphic evidence of what it was that turned this island in the age of Nelson into a kind of hell. As a historian studying and writing about the era of the great sailing ships, I've come here to find out for myself what a voyage to Antigua at the end of the 18th century would have meant for British sailors. August 2010, and the island of Antigua is battered by storms in the wake of Hurricane Earl. Massive rainfall sent torrents coursing down into the sea, splitting open channels and ravines in the hillsides and beaches. When the rain subsided after several days, locals who went out to survey the damage down here on the south of the island in the bay known as English Harbour were confronted with an unexpected sight. The water backed up all in this area behind the berm here and when it found a path of least resistance out it carved a channel and that channel exposed sidewalls uh, from which were uh, sticking out femurs and jaw bones, two skulls that we found, uh, quite a lot of bones. I think eventually we uh, came up with 110 bones, 120 bones, something like that. They weren't deposited straight out on the beach. They were scattered all along the beach both directions. So you're just walking along picking up pieces of oh, human? It was quite eerie. And looking about this high and seeing the cranium of a human being that's got this yellowish brown glow to it, I mean, you immediately know they're quite ancient. That's the moment it hit me and that's where the adrenaline rush came. Was, holy cow, this is not my normal Saturday morning walk. What do I do with these things? But there were so many, and there was not an option to rebury them here. <clears throat> and the next best thing I could do was call Reg Murphy at the Dockyard Museum and find out what do I need to do? How do we uh, take care of these things properly? X marks the spot, and we're going to start right here. Antiguan archaeologist Dr. Reg Murphy is one of the leading historians in the Caribbean, and he is now preparing for an excavation of the beach. There'll be somewhere between two feet to five feet, so we can expect anything. The aim is to try and find out exactly who was buried here on the Antiguan coastline and why. It's part of a bigger project to reassess the colonial story of an island which turns out to be one of the most richly endowed and least researched sites of British imperial history. Right along here you can see is a lighter sand than dark com compost material, then beneath that sandy again. So we know these are like the frequencies of hurricanes. The beach is never the same, the sand is always moving. So. This is good news because it shows there's good stratigraphy, good deposition, which hopefully means intact burials deep down. So it's perfect, perfect condition, what I, what I hope to see. But now it's just hard work. See this top stuff up. Antigua was one of a string of British possessions in the Caribbean, inconveniently interrupted by the occasional French island. Through much of the 18th century, the West Indies, highly valued for their lucrative commodities, were the scene of a sequence of colonial wars as the European powers of Spain, Holland, France and Britain jostled for ownership of the islands. But in the last decades of the century, 
Britain emerged as the dominant power in the region, thanks to the supremacy of her naval fleet. Throughout the 18th and 19th centuries, this natural harbour was a safe haven for naval ships sheltering during the hurricane season. And the main business of the dockyard happened just the other side of the headland over there. But many of the naval vessels, the powerful ships of the line, the fast frigates, the nimble cutters and sloops, they anchored here at Galleon Beach. Consequently, over the centuries, this stretch of sand was imprinted with the footsteps of many thousands of sailors coming and going. And for many, this was their first taste of the Caribbean. But for some, it was their last. During the hurricane season, this harbour would have contained as many as 20 warships, vessels of the Royal Navy's Windward Island fleet. They sailed here from all over the empire, and their role was to protect British trade. Some of them carried a grim cargo. Dead sailors, victims of virulent and little understood tropical diseases. It seems likely that they rowed them ashore and buried them as quickly as they could here on the beach. At least, that's the theory Reg Murphy has been working on since the bones appeared after the hurricane. OK, I've been looking for clues as to who the people on the beach could possibly be and how did they come to be on that beach. So, and this is by William Brazen, mm -hmm. and this is the dockyard in 1754, just when they're completing the expansion of the naval yard to the west side, where we are now. But the interesting point is, this is the beach where we're excavating, Freeman's Bay. And here is Fort Charlotte, Fort Berkeley, and here's a frigate moored right in the middle of the bay, just like we thought, stern to that very beach. Mm -hmm. So if you're on board this ship and something happened to you, you died overnight, the closest place to burial would be that beach. To investigate what appears to be some kind of beach graveyard, Reg has put together an international team of archaeologists. We know a lot of this is Phil. We know a lot of it is going to be modern, so we can move a little bit more quickly through the upper levels. And then once we hit historic deposits, slow down and be a little bit more careful about what we're looking for. Dr. Samantha Rebovich is an American historian working for the National Parks of Antigua. We're hoping that we come across some fairly intact human remains that we can then do more testing on. If a burial site is located, bioarchaeologists on the team plan to undertake tests on skeletal remains to analyze diet, illnesses, and physical condition of the dead. They also hope that the dig will help answer one of the more baffling questions about the sailors and soldiers on Antigua. And one of the sort of historical mysteries is why was the mortality rate so high in the West Indies? Unfortunately, the time frame for this dig is very limited. In an ideal world, you would have as much time in the world to do archaeology. But we're moving a bit quickly with this excavation for several reasons. We are technically in hurricane season, so there's always that idea in the back of our head that we want to get in and get out. You always want to move a little bit faster also when you're dealing with human remains because you don't want to leave them exposed for very long. So it is a bit of a trade-off in terms of how meticulous we can be, but at the same time, we're always very careful. So what were Britain and her Navy doing in Antigua? This is what it was all about a fashionable and addictive stimulant at the very heart of the British and European economies, sugar. The island was colonised by the English in 1632, and over the next 50 years, sugar was gradually established as the dominant and determining feature of the island's life, landscape, economy and culture. Antigua was an important part of the British Caribbean, producing sugar for metropolitan consumption back in, in Britain. Uh, that sugar was produced on large plantations and those plantations employed the labor of enslaved people um, imported from Africa. 
Caribbean sugar was a major provider of revenue, both for the British and also the French exchequer. In fact, the largest French colony in the West Indies, Haiti, then known as Saint-Domingue, produced more sugar than all the British islands put together. Sugar was a principal source of commercial and military rivalry between the two countries. And when France threatened the British West Indies during the American War of Independence, Britain immediately redeployed troops to the Caribbean, preferring to sacrifice America than lose control of her sugar islands. It's no surprise that only a few years after the end of that war, Nelson found himself patrolling the Caribbean with a fleet of warships. It's so easy to think of Nelson only in terms of his great naval battles, the victories of the Napoleonic Wars at the Nile, Copenhagen and Trafalgar. But like so many of the sailors of his era, Nelson spent much of his life and the formative years of his career in the Caribbean. Nelson was very familiar with the West Indies and the Caribbean. Uh, his first voyage at the age of 13 was on a merchant ship which went to the West Indies. And he spent most of the war of American independence um, in the West Indies out and on the North American station based basically in Jamaica. He saw his first real fighting in the West Indies, in Central America. And he had his first commands in the West Indies. He commanded two frigates and a brig during the American War of Independence in the West Indies. So this was an area he knew very well. On the 28th of July, 1784, at the age of 28, Captain Nelson sailed the Boreas into English Harbor where he spent four long hurricane seasons. English Harbour in the age of Nelson was far more than just a safe haven for passing ships. It was the industrial epicentre of British naval power in the Caribbean. Over there in the dockyard, there were furnaces for smelting iron and boiling tar, and the air would have been thick with burning sulphur, brimstone used to cleanse the inside of filthy ships. The water would have been disgusting, the waste from all of the industrial processes was just thrown into the sea. And we know from archaeological excavation over where the ships were at anchor that the seabed is literally feet thick with rubbish. And the sailors simply threw overboard everything that they didn't need. Think about the sewage. When a fleet was here, hundreds, sometimes thousands of people were living on ships at anchor. And their raw sewage went straight into the sea. There's barely any tide here. There are no ocean currents that can come and cleanse this place. So in the age of sail, this magnificent harbour was a cesspit. And the ships themselves were desperately unhealthy places, with so many people crammed into such a confined space. And out here on the water, it's also incredibly hot. It's a bit like being in the crater of a volcano, and these hills stifle the wind. Life on those ships must have been unbearable. But then, frankly, you were lucky to be alive. Tropical fevers, mostly diseases borne by mosquitoes, flourished across the Caribbean, largely as a result of the destruction of the natural ecology by plantation farmers. Malaria was a problem, yellow fever in particular caused havoc. Anybody serving in the British Army or in the British Navy who discovered that they were being posted to the Caribbean would certainly have been terrified by that prospect. They would have been terrified not really because of the sorts of uh, military uh, experiences that they might have in the Caribbean. They would have been terrified because of the reputation that the Caribbean had as a charnel house, a place where people died, a place where people died of disease. Up above the harbour are the remnants of a large military compound, part of a vast defensive system of fortifications that surrounded the island as protection against the threat of French invasion. Towards the end of the first day of digging at the beach excavation site, Reg Murphy took me to visit the old military cemetery attached to the compound to look at the grave of the young wife of an officer who died while her husband was serving on the island. The inscription captures something of the fear and the misery of serving in this tropical outpost. It says, sacred to the memory 
of Harriet, Harriet, the beloved wife of Sergeant Major T.W. Hipkin of HM 54th Regiment, who fell a victim to the withering effects, and that's important, withering, withering effects, effects of this climate and dysentery on the 23rd June, 1851. Now that's just before this regiment left. Age 33 years old, the last tribute of his sorrowing husband. So he's buried his wife here. He left her behind. And the funny thing is, less than 100 officers or men were allowed to bring their wives, but she accompanied him out here. And it's, uh, it's, a, it's sad to think that she's still here, and he, had, he moved on. But what's important is, died of the withering effects of this climate. When people are withering, um, to me, I take that as meaning they're sickly, the heat. Not just the heat, maybe it's the food, maybe it's the water. Um, what else is making you wither? Is it, are uh, you being poisoned? Um, and then the dysentery. Well, dysentery, we know that's pretty efficient. So you get a sense of, of her losing weight, becoming weaker, becoming sicker. Yeah. And they, they, was, they were certainly clear that it was the climate that was to blame. So this is a monument, a megalith to the 54th Regiment. They served all through the Caribbean islands, but they lost more in Antigua than anywhere else. So the monument was erected here. So Antigua was a more unhealthy place than other islands in the Caribbean? It's known as the graveyard of the Englishman, and that would have been for some serious reason. Most other islands never acquired such an infamous um, label. Diseases were killing all the troops that were sent out here. The fact that we've got such order up here, up in the hills, really raises the question of why there was so much chaos down on the beach. To me, it means one thing, epidemic. If you have a lot of bodies you have to deal with very quickly, suddenly the beach becomes a very fast, disposable place. The aim of the archaeological investigation on Galleon Beach is to locate an intact grave that will help substantiate Reg's theory and provide a real identity for the bones uncovered by the hurricane. But as with any archaeological dig, you don't always get what you're looking for. The British were by no means the first sailors to use this harbour. There's evidence of human occupation on Antigua from 5,000 years ago. And this sheltered bay would have been a landing point for Caribbean tribes, known as Arawaks, who travelled and settled here long before the arrival of Columbus and European colonisation. Two days into the dig, Reg has yet to uncover any sailor's bones. But he has hit upon an Arawak midden, or rubbish dump. So easy to collect. You just come in, you're tired, you're hungry. You grab the closest resource you can find, shellfish nearby. You got lunch, you got fire pits, and we have what we think is a post hole. They may have had a little building here. So they had shelter, stay for a little while, refresh, and then you move on to another island. What I have found is bits of a um, broken stone axe. You can see it was used. And this material is, uh, this rock, pepper rock, comes from St. Martin. So they were definitely you know, coming in, bringing materials. So that's the kind of thing they'd have used to, to crack open shells? Yeah. Or would it have been much sharper than that? Cut up, or repair your canoe. It would have been a lot sharper. OK, so more like an axe than a hammer? Yeah, it's an axe. OK. This is a scraper. Yeah. It's a beautiful tool, repointing along here. It's still razor sharp after all these years. So a scraper is something that might have been used for butchering? Yeah. Yeah, OK. Or for scraping a piece of meat, or yeah. you, again, for woodworking, because remember, the canoes are really important to them. What we have here is the lip of a conch shell. As simple as this looks, you take this, and then you, this is the first phase, and you cut along here. It's the thinnest part. If you notice, the middle is thicker, yep. it gets really thin. You break along there, and you sharpen this end, and you have a beautiful axe. But the interesting thing about this site, though, is uh, also in all of this, we're finding a European thimble. Hmm. I mean, I don't think they used thimbles back then, but it's a very old thimble. It's a classic sailor's tool. They had a sailor's palm exactly. to drive big needles through canvas, but also smaller ones to do to do yeah. the smaller, more, more delicate work. Repair their uniforms, and yeah. sew up your buttons, and all sorts of things. So this is, this is an amazing artifact. It may seem like an innocuous clue, but for me, that thimble immediately takes you on board one of those frigates lying out in the bay. A tiny thimble might seem like a strange object to associate with a sailor on a massive warship. Yes, ships like these were built for war. The hull's three feet thick to protect the sailors from enemy shot and bristling with cannon. But they were also the sailors' home. The ship's weather deck would have been a hive of activity. Men cleaning the deck, 
exercising at gun drill and queuing to go aloft to trim the sails. The very best of those men would have carried a thimble in their pocket. And what a home it must have been. Hundreds of men living together on a gun deck like this, with very little access to fresh air or light, in a space that is shared with livestock. And then you get sent to the Caribbean, where the heat from the tropics turns the fresh food rancid and the water green with slime. The further forward you come in a ship, the more cramped and dark it becomes. But it's up here, beyond the hammocks, underneath the forecastle, where a sailor might find a little space for himself in a gap between watches to write a letter home or to mend his tattered clothes, perhaps with a tiny copper thimble. After months of living in these conditions, you can just imagine how desperate people would have been to get off their ship and feel dry land beneath their feet. However, shore leave was a rare commodity. Desertion was extremely common, so most sailors who arrived in English harbour would hardly ever have left their ship except under strict controls. Unless, of course, they were sick or dead. At the dig site, there's an air of disappointment. Reggie's excavation, although full of interesting prehistoric artefacts, failed to unearth any of the hoped-for sailors' remains. However, right at the end of the day, there have been some significant developments in the second trench. Fragments of a body are beginning to emerge. Professor Tamara Varney from Lakehead University, Ontario, is one of the senior archaeologists on the dig. You've been getting on. Good. We're just packing up for the day, and so we've backfilled a little bit of the site of the unit so that um, there's not bones um, going to be unprotected overnight. And so what we found in this corner is we found a foot, and, mm -hmm. and it's in very bad shape. So we've just had a very light cover over it. And what's under the mysterious yellow tray? This. Well, this is a very scientific hiding device which um, hides this very poorly preserved skull. Wow. Here. And this is probably not related to that leg bone there. Because it's on a different layer, is that yes. how you work that out? Yeah. And what we have removed from there though, because we don't want them to go missing because they're so exciting, are some buttons that Paula found. These two buttons, one of the first one that we found was found in the screening of the, some of the sand we removed from the site. And the second one we found up against the shin bone. And they are very exciting. They're lovely buttons. The back is brass and the front is uh, has some mother of pearl inlay. So that suggests maybe quite a high status burial? It could suggest that uh, this individual that they were found with was of higher rank than some of the other sailors. Yeah, what's really exciting about these buttons is that they are a little more ornate than the buttons we've typically found at military sites in the past. And with this mother of pearl inlay, um, it's just a lot more elaborate than a plain homemade bone button or shell button, which were typically found on sort of undergarments or pants and shirts. And so that leads us to believe that there's somebody of probably higher rank than the other sailors that we've uncovered at this site and at a nearby Royal Navy Hospital Cemetery. So who did these buttons belong to? They're not from a naval uniform. Perhaps they belonged to a gentleman passenger. Perhaps a planter off to visit his estate. What's remarkable is that so much of the landscape and buildings that their owner would have seen if he had made it on shore alive are still being used today, just as they would have been 250 years ago. One extraordinary relic from the 18th century that's still beautifully preserved is this enormous water collecting tank. There are no rivers or lakes on Antigua. All of the fresh water they used to drink, to cook, to clean, had to come from the sky. Water pours down this slope into vast collection chambers underneath. And sailors would then roll their barrels up here and fill them up and take them back to the ships. 
But what's really remarkable is the graffiti that survives on the surrounding walls. It's a magnificent resource because handwriting is so personal. You get a real sense of the people who are here. Here we've got John Webb, who's chosen to carve his name deep using very straight lines and a very clear O there. Further up, we've got James Gates, who's used a much more cursive hand. The ship Roebuck here, another date, 1743 here. E.G. 1740. Down here, I.D.W.H. in 1748. It's almost like what you would do on the walls in a prison. These men are putting their marks here. They're saying that they've been here. They're saying that they've endured. They're saying that they've survived. After three days' work at the excavation unit, a miraculously complete figure has appeared in the sand. Matt Brown is a bioarchaeologist from City University, New York. We managed to uncover uh, the skeleton that we identified earlier today or yesterday. You can look at the, where the hands are. They're actually laid over the pelvis area. He looks very neat. Yes, yes. Isn't he? Yeah. And from what I understand, sometimes they'd wrap them in their hammocks. So oh. maybe that helped to keep the individual in kind of in, in line. But that makes sense. You can almost see, see the shape of yeah. him being, kind of being a, squashed yeah, together definitely. by his hammock and definitely. his head's almost slightly raised, yeah. hunched forward. Can you give me a rough idea of, of what kind of period we're looking at? As far as dating the individual skeleton, you would likely want to have some kind of artifacts, that kind of thing that would go along with the skeleton to give you some idea of, of a date. But as of right now, we don't have any, any kind of evidence of, of any kind of artifacts here. So the mother of pearl buttons that we found at the end of the yeah. day yesterday, they're, they're actually from a different they're layer. They're from a different layer and different, probably so, different individuals. So probably someone completely different. Yeah. So it kind of emphasizes the complexity of this site. Yeah, definitely. So Corey, what's going on up this end? So what we are doing is we're just starting to uncover uh, a part of the mandible here. You can see it's just the teeth which are still intact in some areas right here. So it's incredibly vivid, isn't it? When the, the teeth emerge, it makes it so much more human almost. Absolutely, and you can um, just see right away that there's uh, a bit of a dental wear on it. So you can see from normal use. So it's, it's really nice to see that we have something there that can be added to all the other ways of which you can age or at least use different age composites to look at. Well, we've come to the end of three really hard days digging and there still seems so much more that we need to do. And as always with archaeology, there's a limited time frame within which to do it. We've pulled all of these skeletal remains from a trench no more than two metres squared, and it's only the second trench that we've dug. But there's more material coming up all the time, and we simply don't know what's going to come next. And such a wealth of material from such a confined space really makes you think about the complexity of the human story that played itself out here. Naval life in the tropics was undoubtedly arduous and dangerous. But what was the island itself like? 30 minutes drive inland, another archaeological dig is underway, excavating one of Antigua's first and largest sugar plantations. British sailors who came here in the 18th century were well aware that the island was wholly given over to the brutal business of industrial-scale sugar cultivation. The whole island was a sea of cane. And if anyone lived a hellish existence here, it was undoubtedly the hundreds of thousands of slaves who were sent here from West Africa. Betty's Hope Plantation was founded in the mid-1600s by one of the island's earliest colonizers, Sir Christopher Codrington. The archeological investigation of the Codrington Plantation is headed by Californian professor, Georgia Fox. Working with a team of students, she's currently excavating the main planter's house. The scale industry, the plantation at one time was about 700 acres, and of course there's a whole cadre of people working here, the managers, overseers, the servants, and about 400 slaves, so it was a huge operation, it was an industrial complex. 
we escaped from the dust and sun into one of the old sugar crushing windmills. So what's the purpose of the excavation at the moment? Well, uh, this is the first plantation house to be excavated on Antigua. So it's, also, it's important for island, local island history. But there are so few plantations that have been fully excavated in the Caribbean region. There still needs a lot of work to be done to understand how plantations function. Historians write about plantations and plantation life, but the archaeology fleshes out those details through the excavation of the material culture, the buildings, the artifacts, and so they might tell us a, a slightly different story. We don't know. The, the artifacts don't lie. We have a whole complex of support buildings to the north of the Great House, which included a servant's quarters, a doctor's office, the overseer's office, and, and other buildings, which we're looking for now. And then we're also looking for the original slave housing, the pre-emancipation slave housing. And would that slave housing would have been nearby, or was that in a slightly separate location? Yes, it would have been nearby because the planters always wanted to keep an eye on their slaves. But at the, at the end of the day, we're also trying to look at not just the plantation as a system, but trying to understand you know, the lives of the people who lived and worked here, whether they were the owners or the slaves. And so we want to have a more holistic picture of the plant, of plantation life. <laughs> Central to the work at Betty's Hope is a search for more detailed archaeological information about slave life. A few shards of rough slave pottery have been unearthed, but there is precious little solid evidence of their homes, culture or experiences. On an island where the majority of the population are descended from slaves, a more detailed and forensic understanding of slavery on the plantations is essential in helping future generations of Antiguans develop a proper understanding of the darkest part of their national story. We've just had a phone call from the guys excavating down on the beach and they've started to uncover another skeleton in the same trench. So we're heading back to English Harbour as quickly as we can. It's a bit of a jumble, as you can tell. We've got a lot of different bones popping up in places that are not anatomically correct. So we've got some fibula over here, another fibula down here, bits of pelvis, pelvic bone over here. Um, we are finding a lot of coffin nails, though, which is very interesting. So I actually just found one here. And we've got one here, two over here. One is actually in a jumble of pelvic bones. And this is the individual that we're, confident, we're pretty confident was associated with the buttons that we found oh, yeah. the other day, those fancy buttons. So in total, how many buttons have we found then? We found a total of five buttons, which is pretty exciting. Um, and they're kind of across the individual, but as I said, the individual's pretty jumbled up, so we're not, can't really infer too much about the placement of the buttons at the moment. Each bone from the site is carefully removed and wrapped to be taken for analysis by Tamara in the project workshop. Since I've been working in Antigua for the last 15 years, I've been specifically interested in, in the British Navy in Antigua and how they lived here and how they adapted to life in the Caribbean. They're dealing with the heat, they're dealing with um, lack of water, sometimes lack of rations, that sort of thing. Central to Tamara's analysis is a detailed examination of diet as revealed by the mineral content in each individual set of bones. I also do um, what we call archaeological bone chemistry. And so I investigate what they were eating um, over their lifetimes and if that diet changed once they got to Antigua. One, two, three. Initially, my work was basically looking at elemental um, components of diet which are later transformed into body tissues and because you essentially are what you eat you can get a very generalized look at what people were eating and people coming from Britain would have been eating a very different diet than people living in the Caribbean or slaves being transported from Africa and in that way I can separate the Europeans from the Africans. Working on bone samples taken during an earlier dig at the site of the cemetery of the Naval Hospital in English Harbour, 
Tamara was able to confirm that Europeans and Africans were buried alongside one another, contradicting some of the notions of racial segregation in the 18th century Caribbean. One of the interesting things about the Naval Hospital Cemetery that I dug a few years back is that there, there were people of African and European ancestry. And you can really see how when the Navy um, brought sailors and soldiers here, that they didn't live as long as the Africans. It's astonishing how young many of the um, sailors and soldiers are when we estimate their age at death from their bones. Seeing these bones being taken out of the ground with such delicacy and care really makes you wonder whether the bodies were put into the ground in the first place with any ceremony and dignity. And these men were husbands, they were sons, they were fathers. Were their families ever told what had become of them? Were they ever told where they'd been buried? And the longer I spend at this dig, it's clear that this is far more than just a scientific exercise. And there's a human tragedy here that we need to understand. The first skeleton from the dig has now been laid out in Tamara's workshop for preliminary analysis. So Tamara, what can, what can you tell us about him? Well, I can tell you that he was in his late 30s when he died, and he's male, and he was about 4, 11, 5 foot in stature. So what are you actually specifically looking at when you're gauging the age of a skeleton? I'm looking to see how rugged it is and how, how much um, porosity is there and how dense the surfaces are. And on a, on a much younger skeleton, what does it look like? Is it shiny or...? It would be much more rugged and, more rugged. and um, a little more coarse. So this is very much you know, the first stage and where you plan to go forward. So well, yes. what do you do next? What I'll do next is examine each one of the bones a little more carefully to see if there's any subtle traces that indicate something about health. Can you get indication of, of disease maybe being a cause of death? You know, it's very rare to be able to find an indicator of cause of death, because cause of death is usually from some sort of soft tissue cause. What we might be able to deduce um, is if he had a traumatic death or if it was a disease um, which left a lot of indication on bone, which I can already say is probably not. It was probably an acute cause of death. The main work on this skeleton will take place back in her lab in Canada, where Tamara is keen to pursue a new line of research looking at the phenomenon of lead poisoning amongst the Caribbean sailors. One of the historical questions has been what was the what, what led to the high mortality rate of the Royal Navy and military in the West Indies? And one of the historical sort of um, hypotheses is a combination of alcoholism and lead poisoning, and with lead poisoning coming from the alcohol. The most important byproduct of sugar production is rum. And uh, rum after sugar is the most important export uh, of the, the Sugar Islands. Rum is an extremely important part of uh, local life on the islands, and planters were renowned for their high living and their drunken antics and behavior. Rum was also regularly doled out to the slaves, but the greatest consumers of rum on Antigua would have been the sailors and soldiers for whom it was the anaesthetic of choice. This is a very old bottle of, would have likely held rum. We know that every sailor got his traditional pint a day served in two batches with mixed with lime and water. So the grog was a very traditional naval drink and they had to have it. In fact, we find an old poster advertising for 200,000 gallons of rum in Antigua to be purchased to supply the military forces in the Eastern Caribbean islands. Also, remember, they're surrounded by plantations. Cheap rum, new rum especially, the, the first distillation was really cheap. I think this rum was probably very poisonous 
all the piping, all the tubes, all the worms that have been distilled, the, the rums being distilled in, is made of lead. And we know from the records that they drank a lot of it in addition to their rations. You know, they're probably taking themselves to an early grave with lead poisoning. And of course, once you get sick, you get sent to the hospital to treat the, the dry belly ache and the flux they all complained about was probably caused by lead poisoning from the rum. And again, when you get you know, bleed you, the only treatment they had was bleeding, blistering, and mercury. That doesn't really help the lead in your body if, that's what, if that is the problem. There was something a little bit more than the, to it than the yellow fever malaria. I think rum was seriously poisonous. It's this lead content in the rum and its absorption into the sailor's bones that has been the subject of Tamara Varney's most recent research. I've been working with some new technology called a synchrotron, which is basically a large atom accelerator that creates brilliant, brilliant light, which allows us to take our analysis to levels which was previously not possible. And with that, we can look at the not just the amount of lead that's been accumulated into bone over a lifetime, but we can actually look at the distribution of that lead um, inside the bone and if it's been incorporated into the bone as opposed to just being a contaminated from the burial environment. Tamara's research indicates that, thanks to the rum, young British men were heavily poisoned with lead while they were in Antigua. This would have compromised their immune systems, making them especially vulnerable to whatever tropical diseases they encountered. It's another fragment of information that only adds to the grim picture of naval life that sailors, like those now appearing in increasing numbers in the excavation trenches, would have endured. So Sam, we've got another extraordinary jumble of bones here. Can you tell me what's going on? Sure. Well, today, well, right now you're looking at at least six individuals. Six? Yes. Crikey, so that's six more from what we've already discovered? Yes. All in this one small area? Yes. <laughs> so right here we've got an individual, and you're seeing two lower leg bones coming out. Yeah. Um, down here, further, We've got two feet, and they're beautifully preserved, they're and they're just, just... poking out of the sand. They've just been chucked on top of each yeah, other. Yeah, they're just, you know, someone was definitely lying down with their feet up in the air. And with these, we've got another one of our fancy buttons and a coffin nail. Here we've got what looks like a very well-preserved skeleton coming out. We're very excited about this one. We're, this is burial number four, and you can see we've got two patellas here, those oh, are the so knee bones. Very neatly neatly placed together. Yes, absolutely. And you've got a bit of the pelvis and the spine coming up. So this looks like it's going to be a really great find. So we're going to work on this area next and see where it goes from there. So Amongst this collection of bones was an unexpected and disconcerting discovery. So what we're looking at with the six individuals that you saw in the trench is we're looking at adults and some sub-adults or people that are juveniles and children. So there are kids in there? Yes, there certainly were. And on ship there were um, children and, and young boys that were apprenticed on the ships. Um, do you get, get a sense of what sort of age we're talking about here? Um, one is under 14 and one is definitely under 16. And you can tell that from which growth plates are not fused, but we haven't really had a, a good look at them as yet. So there's, there's more to come, but we think, we think yes. there are children buried amongst fully grown adults. Yes. We know that boys were commonly employed on ships as servants, as top men in the rigging, and as powder monkeys during battle. But these juvenile skeletons are still a poignant discovery, and one that further contributes to the identification of the bodies as sailors. What's going to be much harder to pin down is the ship that they came from. Thanks to naval records, we know that one vessel, whose crew seems unlikely to have buried any of its number on Galleon Beach, was Horatio Nelson's HMS Boreas. Nelson did actually quite well during this three or four years um, in, in the Boreas. He, he suffered very few uh, casualties through fevers. And scurvy wasn't a problem for him because being in one of the down, one of the upsides of being in port so often was, of course, you did have ready access to fresh provisions, water, fruit, uh, vegetables, this, these sort of things, which became much more problematic when you were on deep sea journeys. Um, so the scurvy problem wasn't such a great one, and he managed to avoid the fevers. 
it was a difficult command, and, and Nelson did try to bring to it elements that would make it more tolerable. One of the things he used to persuade sailors to do was to uh, involve themselves in amateur dramatics. They used to devise plays. Uh, they used to dress up uh, and perform these plays, and Nelson and the officers would go and, and watch them. Uh, and it was interesting to see men capering about in women's dresses and going through uh, this type of performance. Um, he also encouraged dancing and juggling and various other activities. The main reason for the health of Nelson's crew was probably not the dancing, but the relative peace in the Caribbean in the mid-1780s. The worst outbreaks of disease occurred during times of war, and it was during the years immediately after Nelson was in Antigua, in the 1790s, that the island witnessed the most intense period of militarization. Thanks to Britain's war with revolutionary France, Antigua became the most heavily fortified island in the region and a garrison for up to 5,000 troops. The arrival of large numbers of Europeans into uh, Caribbean port towns, which is exactly what happens when you get battalions of troops arriving from Europe. Europeans without any previous exposure to yellow fever, who've built up no immunity to tropical fevers, all arriving at one time in one place, create the perfect conditions for fever to tear through their ranks. And this is exactly what happened in the early 1790s. The revolution in France created turmoil in her colonies in the Caribbean and France's largest and most lucrative possession, Saint-Domingue, witnessed a violent and successful slave-led revolution. French and British troops poured into the Caribbean as the conflict spread, although many of them never made it into battle. By far the majority of the ensuing casualties were caused by tropical fever. English Harbour was notorious for disease and became known as one of the most unhealthy spots in the Caribbean. But it's likely that many of the sailors buried on Galleon Beach were dead before they even arrived in Antigua. An extraordinary account survives of one ship that arrived in May 1793, HMS Experiment. HMS Experiment was a warship that had recently visited the port of St George in Grenada. During her stay there, she appears to have been infected by a ship newly arrived from West Africa with a virulent strain of yellow fever, known as Boulam fever. Shortly after contagion, the experiment was instructed by the Admiralty to assume duties patrolling the waters around St Kitts and Antigua. I managed to track down the naval documents relating to HMS experiment. The journal of the proceedings of His Majesty's ship experiment, kept by her captain, Simon Miller. She was sailing off Dominica. She'd left Grenada, and she's 42 miles to the north of Dominica when things start to go wrong. He notes here, company very sickly. The next day, after some entries about the day-to-day -day life of the ship, again he's put, ship's company very sickly. You can tell he's a man who's starting to get really worried about what's happening. The day after that, departed this life, Richard Ellis, at 11, committed his body to the deep. These entries continue for a number of days. Ship's company sickly. Again, that was just a day after they'd buried Richard Ellis at sea. Then something really interesting happens. Discipline starts to break down on board. The captain has to punish Daniel Denton with 12 lashes for contempt. And the next day, he's punished another sailor called Jonathan Munro, this time with 36 lashes for theft. They're still sailing from Dominica towards Antigua. And then once again, on the same day, 11 departed this life, Thomas Woolingley, at midnight, committed his body to the deep. And the very next day, he has to punish Henry Wood with 12 lashes for neglect. By the time the experiment arrived at the mouth of English Harbour, she was like a ghost ship. 
the few surviving men on board her, incapable of bringing her in. One of the defensive strengths of this harbour is the narrowness of the inlet, but it made the whole process of actually getting in incredibly difficult for these massive and cumbersome sailing warships. To help them, they'd run lines ashore and wrap them around strong points like this. It's a, a cannon sunk into the stone. Now, this was far beyond anything that the crew of the experiment could cope with, so they made a signal for assistance. And a crew from the frigate Sol Bay rode out to help. It was an act of suicide. Every single member of that rescue party was infected and died. The muster books of the experiment in the Sol Bay, the lists of men on board, paint a vivid picture of the rapid demise of the ship's crews. Richard Warren discharged dead. Charles Norburn discharged dead. Thomas Rouston, Robert Tozer, Francis Juno, William Sutherland, Jonathan Leach, George Cook, William Tiller, Sam Dyer, Robert Giles, all dead. Now here too we have the bosun, who was Thomas Carrington, he's recorded as having two servants. So these would have been two boys learning the trade of the bosun. Jonathan Burnett, discharged dead on the 21st of October. And another bosun servant, David Richards, he died on exactly the same day. It just makes you wonder if these are the boys that are buried on Galleon Beach. We'll never know exactly who the bones now being excavated belonged to, but over 200 sailors from the experiment, the Solbay, and other infected ships died in the Boulam fever epidemic in English Harbour towards the end of 1793. And it's more than likely that the bodies of Francis Juno, Robert Tozer, Richard Warren, Jonathan Burnett, and all the others were hurriedly disposed of here on the sand dunes. The full extent of this beach burial site, however, is unclear. And for now, it will have to remain a subject for speculation, as this dig is now beginning to wind up. Yesterday, we found those two perfect feet just sticking out of the sand. Yeah. What happened to them? But we decided, based on the amount of time we have left for this dig, that it's better to leave this individual um, in situ or in place because we actually found that this individual extended further and we'd actually have to cut this all the way back to, to remove or to expose it at least. So when we leave this trench, there's still going to be more archaeological material left? Yeah, there's still going to be individuals here. And it's better that way that, you know, you don't want to take individuals out if you don't have one the space or the time to actually do the analysis. But do you think we've recovered sufficient material to be able to tell this story adequately really well? I think, I think depending on the... the the analyses that are going to be run, as far as sailors, you have a, a large span or a large range of individuals on these boats coming in. If they are dying of, of disease, it's not just affecting older individuals, it's affecting all age groups. Time has run out for the archaeologists. They're leaving at least two unexcavated skeletons in the ground, and they are now pretty confident that there are many more, perhaps hundreds of bodies buried in this sand dune. For the benefit of future archaeologists returning to this fascinating site, the team are leaving a message behind, a simple clue that this small patch has already been dug. We know that some of the sailors who came to Antigua in the 18th century did enjoy the warm seas, the fresh fish, the Caribbean colours, the fruit, the rum. But the brutality of naval life, the overwhelming heat, and the constant fear of disease on this polluted, heavily militarized, factory farm slave island undoubtedly turned Antigua into a kind of hell for most of the men and women who ended up here. But what about Nelson? He had no qualms about the business of the island. As a senior officer, his comforts and living conditions were far easier than they were for his crew. He didn't suffer from sickness until the end of his Caribbean posting. So what made him quite so miserable in English Harbour? 
The answer was boredom, frustration, and a girl called Mary Moutre. English Harbour was a tiny settlement, but the resident British Commodore, Sir John Moutre, had an attractive wife 30 years his junior. Moutre's house, wishfully known as Windsor, was up here on the hill behind the dockyard, where you can feel the breeze coming in from the open sea. And it was at Windsor where Nelson and his good friend Cuthbert Collingwood found a measure of respite from their naval duties in the company of Moutre's beguiling young wife. Unfortunately, it was a short-lived friendship. Mary left Antigua uh, with her husband in the, in the late spring uh, of 85. So Nelson only knew her for really between August and, and, and May. But it actually almost destroyed him. He, he talks in his letters about her being the most amiable person that he had ever known. Uh, he was absolutely um, lost. And he, the first time he went back to English Harbour after she left, he walked up the hill to the house and uh, he was so distraught of the sight of this place where, as he said, I I've spent more happy hours here than anywhere else. He wrote to his brother, this country appears now intolerable, my dear friend being absent. It is barren indeed. English harbour I hate the sight of. Given Nelson's feelings about this place, it's ironic that the dockyard at English Harbour is now universally known as Nelson's Dockyard. But I think it's an important reminder of the historical significance of this site. And so if you think about the bigger picture, I mean, how important is the work that you guys are doing for Antigua? Antigua was, for example, at one point in time on the frontier of the empire. This is where they had to come and protect the resources here. It was valuable because of the sugar. When, once the sugar was gone and it had no value, they were forgotten. Emancipation, slaves were freed, and now we're a sort of small little marginal country in the Eastern Caribbean. For us, it's, we're still groping trying to learn about our past. We must written, let's say, history is his story, the tale told by the winner. What do we know about our history, really, from an Antiguan perspective? If you go back to the history books, who wrote our history? There are no Antiguan, no, no sort of official historians here. So we sort of pick up all these accounts from all, written all over the world. And archaeology to me is like a shake, you know, we, we shake the whole historical tree and see what drops out of it. And in a lot of cases we find it's not exactly the, quite right. Um, for example, looking at that building across the hill up here, that's, that's apparently built for King William IV when he was here in 1787. Turns out it wasn't built until 1805. Thanks to the archaeology we figured it out. Now, so it's a, archaeology tests these things and we are now looking at it from our perspective as Antiguans and um, from what's actually physically there. The archaeological work of Reg and his colleagues is important not just for Antigua, but also for Britain. It's helping piece together the far from complete history of the relationship between our two Atlantic islands. In particular, the excavation of Galleon Beach brings into focus a dark and forgotten chapter of that story and provides a poignant moment of commemoration for the hundreds, probably thousands of young sailors of the British Navy who died in Antigua, not in battle, but in their hammocks, hastily disposed of at the time and forgotten ever since.